We just recently got word. It's all official now. We're going to get to see Teofimo Lopez step back in the ring, defend some of his titles February 8th against Jermaine Ortiz. And Teofimo Lopez, man, has always been one of those guys that's like must-watch TV. He's always been one of the guys that you have to go out there and see. On the way up to his title run, I mean, think about some of the performances that we got to see from this dude. He's out there, the speed, the power, the technique, everything's on full display. He's just racking up these highlight level knockouts. He's out there performing on Heisman night. He's out there just putting people down. And then we get to see it all culminate. Then we get to see the the the, the ultimate test of, of the skills and what he possesses and how he's going to put it all on display when he shows up in there against Vasily Lomachenko. And I'll be the first to admit, when he stepped into that fight, I had him as the underdog, right? Me, Vegas, a whole lot of other people. I didn't think he was going to be able to pull it out. I'm, I'm a huge fan of the skill set that Lomachenko brings to the table. And I just didn't think that, that Lopez was going to be able to figure him out. Couldn't have been more wrong. I could not have been more wrong. I mean, this dude went out there and put on what I have to call a performance for the ages, right? Based off of the level of competition he had, based off of how smooth he made it look, based off of how easy he was able to go in there. And he didn't, you know, he didn't win every round or anything like that. But man, that dude put on a show. I remember at the end of that fight, I was sitting there and I was like, I don't think the way he fought tonight, the way Lopez looked, I don't think there's a man in the world at 135 pounds that's going to give him trouble. I think he's going to be able to go in there and blow the doors off everybody. Now, lo and behold, we didn't see that stick for too long. That's not the, that's not the Teofimo Lopez that showed up in his next fight against Cambosos. Right? He goes in there against Cambosos and it's kind of like the exact opposite. He's showing us the mirror version. He's not being as aggressive as he was. He's, he's holding on to his punches. He's getting dropped by a guy that we did not classify as a puncher. Just overall, pretty much a big thumbs down performance. Gives up the belts, ends up moving up in weight. Who was impressed by the fights against Pedro Campa and Sandor Martin? Were those ones that made us think Teofimo was back? Were those ones that made us think, oh man, this dude, he's, he's showing those glimpses of what we saw in the fight with Lomachenko. He's going to do something special? No. No, we were actually starting to doubt whether or not he still had it. He did too. Remember after the fight when he was like, do I still got it? Then turn around and claims that it's psychological warfare. He knew that the camera was on and he's got media training. Like, wasn't good. Wasn't good. Nevertheless, throughout this whole time, we always wanted to see him. You never really heard people talking about, I'm tired of Teofimo. I don't want to see Teofimo fight. When's he fighting? December what? September what? I'm not interested. You never heard that. When guys get boring, when guys don't turn in good performances, you see people, you see fans start to shun them a little bit. You see people not so quite interested in what they have to say. Then they're down to just talented guys who, who only the hardcore people watch. But that's never been Teofimo's story. This dude always shows up. And dude, when he showed up against Josh Taylor, once again, he showed us the, the, the real skill set that he possesses and what he's able to do when he's just locked in. Because that's always been his thing. It's always been outside of the ring distractions, his emotional state, just kind of what's going on in his life and how he's feeling, whether it's his, whether it's with his father or other things in life, whether it is with his wife. I mean, this dude is still young and he's just going through the roller coaster. And, we're, and for better or worse, it's out there for all of us to see. So he goes in there against Josh Taylor, man. Once again, the underdog. Once again, looking to snatch up all the belts. And once again, puts on a performance that blows the doors off everybody for the most part. I mean, Josh Taylor is highly respected. The man knows how to fight. Teofimo went out there and put it on. Put it out, put it on him in every aspect of the game. Doesn't matter whether we were talking about on the outside with the jab, whether we were talking about leading and being aggressive, whether we were talking about the way he was able to fire off counter punches, setting traps, sitting back on the ropes. He was able to go out there and do everything, man. And the guy snatched up the belts again and is once again standing at the top of the mound. Only to, to, to again start to get us with the... I'm retiring. Like, nobody took that retirement seriously. Everybody figured that it was just a, a play on something that was going on. He was trying to garner more attention. He was going to use it as, as leverage to try to get somebody else in the ring. And lo and behold, we were all right. February 8th, he's going to be stepping in there. The man he's going to be standing across from is Jermaine Ortiz. Now, I'm a Jermaine Ortiz fan. He came onto a lot of people's radar when he put up that good performance against Vasily Lomachenko. That surprised a lot of people. You know, me, again, me included. I've mentioned how high I am on Lomachenko's skills. The man is incredibly talented. Let's not forget the fact that he's fighting above his ideal weight class. It's like Floyd Mayweather in that regard. Floyd was never a 147 pounder. Floyd was never a 154 pounder. He competed at those divisions because the fights were there and the money was there. And he was able to compete at those divisions because the man was so good. That's what we're talking about with Loma. Man, Loma should be like 126. He moved up to 130. He moved up to 135 for bigger fights. For money fights, because he wants to set a legacy. He wanted to become this multiple, you know, multi-division world champion. Things that he's all done. 
But again, we gotta we gotta recognize that and think about how it speaks to his skill set. The man is incredibly talented. So when Jermaine Ortiz goes out there and puts on a really good performance against him, even though he comes up short, you know, that's something that we gotta respect. That's something that we gotta look at and take notice. And for the people who just got put onto his radar onto Jermaine Ortiz, he was on their radar with that fight against Lomachenko. Don't forget about the fact that right before that, he went out and beat Jamal Herring. You know, Jamal Herring isn't the biggest name guy in the weight division, but that man can fight. He knows exactly what's up. When you go out there and you get a win against Jamal Herring, you earned it. He didn't He didn't give it away. He didn't not show up that night. He wasn't unprepared. Jermaine Ortiz went out there and won that fight. And you look at Ortiz, man, I like him. I like him. He's young. Well, relatively young, 27 years old, right? We wouldn't call him old, but you know, young, you're thinking like 23, 24, right? He's just kind of start to hit that range, but he's still got all that youthful energy. He's got that. He's physically strong. He's starting to really come into his weight. We saw that at the last fight. It was a catch weight of 138, but man, his back, his legs, his calves, everything looked big. It looks like he's really filling out. So he steps into this one at 140. I imagine he's going to look like a true 140 pounder. I don't think he's going to look like an overstuffed lightweight coming up to 140, trying to chase some belts, trying to chase a fight, trying to chase names. I think he's going to look legit. He's going to look good. He's 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 a solid fighter, right? Like the man can do it all. Now, he can't do it all at an elite level, but he can do it all. You want to see him work the jab? We can do that. He'll triple it up. He'll, he'll shoot four jabs. He'll use it and be aggressive. He'll try to move guys around the ring. Once he gets that jab going and establishes the distance, we see him start to land the right hands. We see him start to work behind it and put some things together. And then all of a sudden, the opponent will start to get aggressive. He knows how to back up and set traps. He can go off the ropes and counter punch. He can get on there on the inside and work a little bit. He could, He doesn't necessarily need the jab. He can go with a lead right hand. Like he, he can do all of these things. There's a reason his name is the technician. And one of the highest compliments that you can get, he was given after the, after the fight with Lomachenko. Vasily Lomachenko came out and said, Jermaine Ortiz knows how to fight. Period. He knows how to fight. And believe it or not, there's a lot of guys who compete at this level who who don't really know how to fight. Like they don't own the knowledge. They don't own the space. They're taught things. They memorize movements. They can recognize things that's going on with their opponents, but they don't actually truly grasp the knowledge, right? One of the easiest ways to think about that is how come you see so many good fighters who can't translate to being good trainers? It's because, you know, they know some stuff, but they need to be taught. And then they can go in and execute. They're not at a point where they fully understand the knowledge and can then turn around and translate that knowledge and teach it to somebody else. That's, you know, that's, it's different. There's, there's, there's different levels to things that go on. And how many good trainers do we know who were not good fighters at all? Almost bums, right? There's a lot of guys out there who were average subpar type fighters, but they can put it together and they can go out there and they can execute. It's because they know how to fight and they know how to transmit the knowledge. For whatever reason, they weren't able to go out there and execute. Maybe they're not athletically gifted. Or maybe they can see things, but they just can't pull the trigger on them and make it happen. But Jermaine Ortiz knows how to fight, man. He owns that knowledge. So even when he's in there and he gets in trouble, even when he's in there and the fight isn't going necessarily the way he wants, even when he's trying something and it isn't exactly working, that's a guy who's going to be able to think on his feet. That's a guy who's going to be able to make some adjustments. That's a guy who's not necessarily going to get overwhelmed in the moment. Things aren't going to be too big for him. He's going to be able to see the angles and the cracks and the holes. And his, once things start to slow down a little bit and put it together, right? That's the, that's the type of dude that he is. And you combine that with the physical skills he has. You combine that with the way that he's been schooled on how he fights. All in all, there's a reason he's got the nickname, the technician. And it's because he knows what he's doing. And he's a very technical fighter. And that's going to give almost anybody trouble. That's going to give almost anybody problems. But unfortunately for him, you know, he's not a perfect fighter. He's got some holes in his game. And some of the holes that he's got in his game aren't going to match up well against Teofimo, right? If I'm just calling it like it is, I'm just telling you like I see it. He's got some defensive flaws. And Teo, man, his offense is, his offense is special, right? We can look back in this last fight when Ortiz stepped in there against Antonio Moran, right? We can look in this, in the first round, he's getting caught with some counter right hands. We can see he's up here. He's trying to press. He's throwing a 2-1, which is you're trying to switch it up a little bit, right? Open up with the open up with the lead right hand instead of the jab and then try to and then try to work into a jab. Problem with that is he leaves himself wide open and gets caught with this beautiful counter left hook. We see him sometimes he'll get pressed back and get caught with the right hand. He can go up against the ropes. Look at the way Moran backs him up here against the ropes. All of a sudden he's able to change the angle a little bit and he's able to land this nasty left hook to the body after going upstairs with it twice. 
Watch some of the ways he's over here. He's getting caught with some of these right hands, whether they're counter right hands, whether Moran's able to lead and get off with the right hand, just coming forward. And with a couple of these shots here, he was able to actually hurt Ortiz, right? He, he, he had him covering up. He had him moving around the ring. He had him going against the ropes, trying to buy time and gather himself. That's going to be trouble against a guy like Teo, man. Teo is he's so fast. He's got those twitchy muscle fibers. Like he, he fires off those counter left hooks and those counter right hands. I mean, it might be the quickest in the game. It, it, it honestly might be. Look at some of these counter right uppercuts that he shoots when guys try to use a jab. Or look at these counter right hands and hook him over the top. With Look at these counter left hooks and the way he fires these off. When you've got a guy like Jermaine Ortiz, who's got defensive flaws, where he's getting caught with way too many shots against guys who are journeymen, against guys who are contenders, against guys who are gatekeepers, that's not going to play well against a guy like Taylor who's got twitchy, fast muscle fibers and real legit power. Now, is it real legit power at 140 pounds? Uh, I mean, look, it's not the type of thing that we saw from at 135. I'll be the first to admit it. At 135, he was a big guy, man. And he was going out there and he was cracking them dudes and he was hurting them. Maybe that's not the type of power we see from him at 140. Certainly hasn't yet. Maybe he fills out a little bit and he gets a little bit more, but I don't think we're going to see that type of devastation at 135. Nevertheless, you know he can punch. And Jermaine was a guy that came up from 135 with him. He wasn't just naturally this bigger guy that could never, never draw himself down to that way. So I think... It may be a little bit more comparable as these two move up versus, a, you know, fighting a guy who is never going to be able to make 135 pounds. But Teo, he's got some pop. He's going to be able to hurt you. He's going to be able to keep you honest. He's not going to be a guy that you're going to just bum rush and come in on. I don't care if he's fighting at 147 pounds. He's still going to have enough pop to keep people honest. And unfortunately, in this one for Jermaine Ortiz, man, I think he's going to get caught with way too many shots. You know, he's going to look good in spots. He's going to be able to work that jab. He's going to be able to come forward. He's going to be able to set a few traps. He's going to be able to fight on the inside or switch up some angles and things and get some punches off. But he's going to get caught. I think he's going to start getting caught early in this fight, and I think it's going to start to progress. If he, if, if the tail goes to the body with that right hand, which we've seen him do in the past, he could start to take some wind out of his legs, start to start to drain that energy level a little bit, a little bit have Jermaine Ortiz slow down, stay in front of him a little bit more, because Ortiz likes to move. He's got good feet. But that doesn't, that's not usually what you see from guys in the 7th, 8th, ninth, 10th round. They start to slow down. All those body shots start to add up. All that wear and tear starts to get to a guy. Teo's too fast. He's too strong. He's highly skilled in his own right. You know, I don't know what the line's going to be on this one. We just recently saw this announcement getting made. But it's tough for me to pick pick Jormaine Ortiz in this one, man. I think uh, I think Teofimo Lopez is going to come out with the victory. I think he's going to come out relatively unscathed. You know, if this were to go 12 rounds, maybe he loses three of them. I think he's going to look pretty good in the performance and it's really just going to set up this next fight right because Jermaine Ortiz he's up there and we talk about him but we don't talk about him like we talk about you know a, a fight with Ryan Garcia which would be huge money we don't talk about him like we talk about Devin Haney and the way he's been dominating and how good he is and, and what's going to be next for him and are we going to see him step in there against Tiafi Moore and it's like there, there are certain guys that are at this absolute top level. And we're talking about them there because they're either like Ryan Garcia because they generate the money. And we're talking about them because it's like uh, a Devin, uh, Devin Haney, T um, Tank, you know, Gervonta Davis type thing where we're talking about them when they're up there because their skill level is that high. Right, that's how we're talking about Teofimo. This dude isn't like some massive pay-per-view star. Right, we're talking about him because his skill level is that high and he's up there. He does generate enough buzz though that... People want to get in the ring with him. It's not like he's a he's boots, right? Jerron Ennis, where it's like, man, this guy is highly talented, but he's almost got no buzz. So everyone wants to avoid him because he's just a dangerous fight with not much upside. You know, that's not the case with Tio. So he's going to be able to get guys in there. There's He's got those belts. Guys want to come in there and fight him. So he comes out with the victory on this one. We could be looking at a massive fight in the summer or maybe even the fall, depending on how schedules line up and, and how things go with negotiations. It's all going to be about, like I said before, it's all about his mental state, man. What does he look like when he comes in there? How is he feeling? What, we don't get to sit in there in the fighter meetings, but we've heard you know, Andre Ward and, and Tim Bradley talk about some of the different ways that Taylor's coming into these fighter meetings and the vibe that he's given and the things that he's talking about, the way that his dad's responding to things and how stuff has been. So, man, I really hope he's locked in. I really hope he's firing on all cylinders. I really hope that when we see him come out there, not only against Jermaine Ortiz on February 8th, but for the rest of his career, like I hope we always see this dude at, the, at at his best. I hope he always shows up and gives us absolutely everything that he has because when he does, it's something special. So I think Tao comes out with this one. I think he gets the victory. I think he looks good when he does it. 
Let me know what you guys think. Am I underestimating Jermaine Ortiz? Do, is, is, is there stuff going on in Taylor's life that's going to prevent him from, from performing at the highest level on this one? Let me know.